Now, the title of the talk uh, this morning is Teaching in the Globalized University. How do, we, how do we face the challenges of the multicultural classroom? And um, after I had actually prepared my speech, I saw this week's issue of uh, University World News. And there, the CEO and president of the Institute of International Education in the United States, Alan Goodman, had a piece which I thought was very much to the point of some of the things that we will be talking about uh, today. Because he talks about global education imperative, building bridges. And I thought this idea of building bridges was uh, key to what I had actually already prepared to talk to you about today. So I'd like to just very briefly quote the three bridges that he talks about when you're building a global perspective in higher education. And he says, and I quote, the potential for each individual to build bridges suggests a foundation upon which education can build a global perspective. For me, this translates into three imperatives today. And then he goes on to list the three imperatives, and I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I will mention the three, uh, the three imperatives. The first one is to learn to speak other languages. He doesn't have to tell that to us uh, in the Nordic countries, because our languages are not so widely known in the world. Whether we speak Danish or Swedish, it's still small languages. Um, and we do know that we have to have English. But we also need to remind ourselves that there are other languages out there. There are major world languages to be learned, which actually has first language speakers, which are much more numerous than the first language speakers of English, if you talk about uh, Chinese, for instance. But also that in our societies, there are so many languages represented, and we should see those also as a resource in higher education. And for the students and the graduates, when they enter into the uh, uh, um, labor market and uh, take up positions where they will be in contact with people from other cultures and with other languages. The second imperative is to accommodate the displaced and disconnected. And he is not only talking about uh, refugees or immigrants, but actually a lot of people travel uh, as a result of globalization. And with all the migration, there are people who do feel displaced uh, and disconnected. And sometimes even our international students feel like that, or some of the local students in our, in our universities. So we have to think about all the students in the, our classrooms, not the local students and the international students, because the picture is much more complicated, much more diverse than that. And I think it's, it's good if we can remind ourselves about that. And finally, he says that we need to assign and read uh, literature, documentation, scholarly articles written by people who are different from ourselves, who have different perspectives. And here the diversity is actually not only about culture and languages, but maybe also disciplines. Anyway, this, int this introduction actually um, encompasses a lot of the complexity of the internationalization of higher education around the world, and certainly also um, in Europe and in our countries here in the North. And the title, um, that uh, Clara gave me for, for today, teaching in the globalized university, how do we face the challenges, actually begs three que four questions. Um, what is the globalized university? What do we mean when we say the multicultural classroom? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities, I could ask? And what can we do about it? And this is actually what I will be talking about uh, in the next half hour or so. Um, 
So let's take the four points here in turn. I already talked a little bit about the globalized university. What do we actually mean, globalized, international? For me, society as such is part of a globalized world. We are more interconnected than we have ever been. But if we move into the literature on higher education, we would typically talk about internationalization of higher education. So this is also the perspective that I will take at the same time as reminding all of us that about what Alan Goodman said in his piece uh, this week. It is about building bridges between people with diverse backgrounds. A couple of years ago, in 2015, there was a large group of, uh, or a group of researchers who were given the task of uh, creating an overview, an update, and in a definition of what do we actually mean by uh, internationalization of higher education. What is it? A lot of people talk about it, but what is it? And they came up with this definition, which was based on previous definitions known uh, in the sort of community of people working in internationalization and researching the internationalization of higher education. But at the same time, they also added some perspectives that I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, in just a moment. But let's have a look at their updated definition, which is now sort of the, the, the one definition that um, circulates in the, in the literature on this topic. And they say that internationalization of higher education is the intentional process of integrating an international, intercultural, and global dimension into the purpose, the functions, and the delivery of post-secondary education, so higher education. In order to enhance the quality of education and research for all students and staff, and to make a meaningful contribution to society. So, we are here for the students, but we are also here because we build graduates for a globalized world and a globalized labor market, where they are to function uh, when they graduate from our universities. I think there are three points that I would like to make about this definition. First of all, it's very interesting to see that it's for all students. So we're not talking about us and them, the international students and the local students. We're simply talking about the students. Because what we do when we internationalize our higher education has to be to the benefit of all the students. That's the first point. The second point is, if you look at this definition, it does not say a single word about mobility. You can actually have international, internationalization of higher education without mobile students, without exchange students, without students moving around. Mobility is one tool in the toolbox of internationalizing higher education. But you can have an internationalized inter uh, program in your university without any mobile students. That's the second point. The third point is to say, it doesn't say anything about English. It can be in any language. So English, again, is a tool in the toolbox in order to have more people meet, at least in our part of the world, to uh, come together in the international classroom, in the multicultural classroom, and, and the, the vehicle of the communication there is English but it could be any language. And in other, in other parts of Europe, it might be French, or it might be Russian, or it might be Spanish. And if we go further afield, uh, uh, it's uh, different languages again, Mandarin Chinese, for instance. 
So if we look at our colleagues in Southern Europe, in Portugal and Spain, the, the students they attract is very much from, from South America, Portuguese and Spanish-speaking students. So they don't have the same level of uh, English medium instruction that we see in the northern part of Europe. So what I, my, my point here is to say, we, in our part of Europe, very often think about international programs as being English medium instruction programs, but it's only one of several solutions when we look at the uh, broader picture. Now, linked to this definition is another one which actually also happened to be updated and published in 2015. It's very closely linked to the DeWitt and, and, and colleagues' definition of internationalization. And uh, Balin and Jones talk about internationalization at home. Now, that's a big issue. I happen to be one of the people, and might be one of the few people in this room, who was very active in establishing the first Erasmus uh, pro, uh, uh, exchanges 30 years ago, when the Erasmus program was started. And at that time, we had this idea that within, say, 10 years or so, we would have around 90% of the students going abroad as part of their university program. Now, that was perhaps a little bit naive. Uh, we had other naive thoughts on internationalization of higher education in those days. But we were young, and so was the world. Um, we know today that a, a target of 20% is very high. Uh, most universities internationally rec recognized research universities have 10, 15% of their students as international students, and if they have 20, it's really good. So instead of having, say, 80% uh, mobile students and 20% of the students staying at home, it's the other way around. It's 20% of the students that become mobile as part of their education, either as exchange student or because they take uh, part or all of their, uh, both of their degrees, so they might have a bachelor from their, their home country and then a master's degree somewhere else. But it's about, it, it, it's in, 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 the, in the best of situations, that might be 20%. The 80% of the students stay at home during higher education. So how can we prepare those students to become globalized citizens, to think about how can we internationalize at home? And that has also developed uh, over the years. Um, and it actually started uh, almost 20 years ago with Bengt Nilsson and a few other people from Sweden started talking about internationalization at home. And I remember in those days, and remember we were young and naive, uh, we thought, oh, why does he talk about that? That's ridiculous. We're talking about moving students around. But actually he was right. And today, uh, when we talk about internationalizing our universities, we also have to talk about internationalization at home, uh, where we have a purposeful integration of international and intercultural dimensions in the formal and the informal curriculum, so both in, what, in the content, but also how we teach uh, and, and the way we teach uh, students in the classroom, where we have both, again, the domestic and, and mobile students together, but we look at them as students in the international, in the multicultural classroom, and thereby create internationalization at home for the majority of our students. So, the next question is, of course, if, if we have an idea about what we mean when we talk about internationalization of higher education, students becoming graduates in a globalized world. Uh, we focus on internationalization at home. Then we create multicultural classrooms, which 
then begs the question, what do we mean by the multicultural classroom? And in this context, I have this quote from Merman, who wrote a book um, quite a few years ago, but I like the quote, all natives take their native knowledge for granted, take it to be nothing else than the nature of the world. So unless we remind ourselves that this is not so, we tend to think that everybody thinks and has the same perspective as we do ourselves. And that's why Arlen Goodman, in the, in the quotation that I gave you at the beginning uh, from, um, from this week's University World News, say it's important that students are challenged by something written by somebody who thinks in a different way, has a different perspective. Because that's the only way that they can learn to navigate, if you will, in the uh, globalized world. We have to remind ourselves over and over again that what we take for granted is different what, from what a lot of other people would take for granted. In a project uh, which I had the pleasure of, of uh, coordinating um, a few years back from 12 to 15, we looked at the challenges and opportunities in the multilingual and multicultural classroom. And at that time, we adopted the figure that you see on the screen now, uh, which comes from uh, other people earlier on, but we used it in our project, the Intel Uni project, um, because it, in, in a very simple way, it illustrates uh, what we face in the globalized university or in the international classroom. Because in that classroom, Oops, that was, not, that was not what I wanted. Okay. Oh, here we are. Yeah. In that multicultural classroom, everybody brings their own ethnic culture. Um, and, and that can be very different, even if they all have a Swedish or a Danish passport, in your case and mine. They, are, they still have different ethnicities and different backgrounds, so there's a diversity even in the local uh, community. And all the students and all the teachers bring their own ethnic culture, their own ethnic background into the classroom, in addition to the usual um, a demographic uh, diversity of gender, religion, um, socioeconomic background, and so on and so forth. We all come from a culture that we bring into the classroom and where we take our culture for granted unless we are challenged to think otherwise. Secondly, there's a local culture. So if we say that uh, we are now in Stockholm, Sweden, at Stockholm University, we have a lot of, 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 of different people with different ethnic backgrounds, both as academic staff and students. But there's also the local culture of Stockholm, Sweden, uh, in which you all live and navigate. But these people from these cultures then come into the academic culture of Stockholm University. And even though, again, we don't necessarily think about it every day, Stockholm University also has its own culture. As an academic institution, you have a way of thinking about yourselves because you come from Stockholm University. Just as I have a way of thinking about myself and academic culture because I come from Aarhus University. And Aarhus University is actually a merger of several institutions of higher education and research. And it's only 10 years ago that we were formally merged and, and then the whole university reorganized. And 10 years later, I can say we are beginning to think of this as Aarhus University with, 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 with an Aarhus University culture. Um, but I'm sure that you would have and Stockholm University culture, where the, a way that you have to fit in uh, as an individual 
with your own ethnic and cultural uh, and local background in the academic culture of Stockholm University. The same applies to the students when they come here. Whether they're local students, international students, all students have to have to um, accommodate themselves, uh, so to speak, in the academic culture of Stockholm University. They have to learn how to navigate in this particular cultural context. But across from that, and, and perhaps much more important that we often think, there's also a disciplinary culture. There's a lot of difference between the disciplinary cultures in, um, say, uh, arts and humanities and in uh, science and technology or medicine. Um, and perhaps those of us working with educational development tended to think in more general terms, but it actually turns out that there's a lot of disciplinary differences and also differences in how we teach and, and what, what counts as, as especially good or what are no-nos in our disciplinary cultures. They're very, very different. Um, the discourse conventions, the conceptual frameworks, um, there, are lots, there are really more differences than you would think. One of my young colleagues just defended her uh, uh, PhD thesis last year and pointed out the difference, even within the School of Business and Social Sciences, where we work, there's a huge difference between the approaches to teaching in management and in law. So, so then across the university, there are huge differences. And when you start working in intercultural, uh, interdisciplinary uh, programs, for instance, whether it's research programs or education, there are lots of differences to take into consideration. So that our diversity, we, we talk about when we talk about internationalization and ethnic cultures of the students, actually also applies to the disciplines. So they're like these two filters of cultural issues that we need to remember and take into consideration when we are talking about the multicultural classroom. So what are the challenges then? in that multicultural classroom. Well, I would like to talk about challenges and opportunities, and I'd like to illustrate uh, the opportunities uh, with uh, some uh, quotes in a moment. But I'd say that um, I have talked about languages now, and I have talked about cultures, briefly anyway. Um, but there's a third point of how do we teach. So we teach, we would probably say, you would probably agree with me, we teach student-centered and we uh, try to activate the students, get the students engaged. So the buzzwords of higher education in our part of the world is student-centered active learning. But it's also to create an inclusive learning environment for all students. And you could add more, uh, perhaps also more that might be more discipline specific. But these are three key concepts that we work with in higher education uh, today. So let's look a bit more at the combination of language, culture and didactics, our approaches to teaching. Uh, and I have here <coughs> uh, a little task for you. Uh, so, what would you think are the most um, important opportunities for a multicultural classroom? And what would you think are uh, the biggest challenges in the multicultural classroom? I want you to just reflect on that for 48 seconds and um, perhaps talk to the person sitting next to you and, and then we will see what happens.
Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm sure you could have interesting discussions about this, uh, but I just wanted to give you this uh, short break to, to try to voice some of the thoughts that you've had about the, the opportunities and the uh, challenges. Um, Copenhagen University collected a, a series of, of interviews uh, with uh, lecturers from all the... Uh, all the uh, faculties of the university a couple of years back. I have a, a couple of quotes here that uh, will help me make the points that I'm, I'm trying to make in this particular part of my talk. And um, the first one is this one here, uh, where there's a lecturer who says, Planning active learning tasks is time-consuming, but also a joy. I take care and attention over how students will learn by doing the tasks and how mixed nationality groups can benefit from their diverse experiences. It's that last bit that I like in this particular quote, is how mixed nationality groups can benefit from their diverse experiences. Because one of the challenges, but if you ask me, also one of the opportunities, is to have students engaged in teamwork, in group work, uh, as, as part of, of, of what they do in our multicultural classrooms. But very often, lecturers find that a challenge. But if you, if you will, force the students to be working in international groups, in multicultural groups, and they can learn a lot. And what we hear both in the research that's been done on this particular topic, but also if you move into the multicultural classroom, is that students hmm, don't quite buy it at the beginning. But if you say, well, this is how we do it, so they actually learn a lot from being part of a multicultural group of peers, and they can really learn from each other. But it takes some work on your side to organize that in order for them to take the full benefit of this particular uh, interaction. The next quote uh, is this one. I often ask the students specifically to talk about what things might look like in their own country with regard to the topic at hand. This, is, this not only encourages them to participate, but also explicitly recognizes the resources present in the classroom. And here again, it's the last part. It recognizes the resources in the classroom. All the students take their own culture for granted. Remember the quote. But they also have tacit knowledge. Knowledge that they do not necessarily share with others unless you invite them to do so. So an important part of te teaching a multicultural group of students is also to recognize their diverse backgrounds and bring their knowledge, their prior knowledge and skills to bear on what you are doing together in the multicultural classroom. And the third um, point is this one here. Because of different traditions, I want to learn how they view the roles of students and teachers, respectively, including the social interactions and positions. And this is, this is the third point that I want to make in this context with, with the quotes. We have to be aware that the students in the classroom do not necessarily have the same expectations of the roles of teachers and students. Now, where I come from, in Denmark, we have a very flat hierarchy. And even though there are differences between Denmark and Sweden, I'm sure that there also, there's also a relatively flat hierarchy uh, in Swedish higher education. So there's, there's, there's a more equal terms between the teacher and the student. And our students, our local students, are used to that. It's, not, um, it, it's nothing to them because it's just the nature of the world. Is there any different way of doing it? But if you come from a different context, 
uh, a different cultural context, it can be very, very hard to interpret that, that flat hierarchy. Um, there can be students who have uh, difficulties approaching a teacher because um, they're not used to that. They're not used to asking questions. You can't ask questions because the teacher thinks I'm stupid if I ask questions. Well, in our culture, if you ask a question, it shows that you are engaged, that you want to be part of the learning community and you want to contribute. So we want students to challenge what's being said. We want students to, to, to ask questions and to interact. But in other cultures, and not also cultures not so very far from here, um, that's not the case. So we have to think of a way of engaging all the students in the classroom, make them aware that asking questions is okay, that I am the teacher, I'm also the one who will be grading your exam papers at the end of this term, but we're working together and you can ask questions, and I don't think you're stupid if you ask questions. <clears throat> So, in this particular part about the multicultural classroom and with the quotes, I, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that yes, there might be challenges, yes, it might be more time consuming when you first start having a, more a multicultural classroom and perhaps also start teaching in another language, English, as the case in point here. But there are also some opportunities, and the important thing is to start looking at the opportunities. The glass is half full, as we would say, rather than looking at the challenges and only talk about the fact that the glass is half empty. But what can we do? What should we do? Well, um, we have colleagues... Uh, uh, Lesk and Carol. Le Betty Lesk come from, comes from Australia, but has taught in, uh, or, or given workshops in all over the world in the past 10-20 uh, years. And Jude Carroll, who's an American living in England, has traveled the world and taught in Asia, in Australia, in the UK, in Africa, in Europe. And in connection with an Australian uh, project a few years back, they uh, developed good practice principles uh, for the international multicultural classroom. And I'm just going to very briefly introduce these uh, principles to you. Obviously, everything I say is something which needs to be translated. So they're into your disciplinary context, to the content that you teach in your particular context here in your discipline at Stockholm University. But it's a good way of sometimes diagnosing what goes wrong, but even better, used as an inspiration for how we organize ourselves when we have diverse student audiences. And the first point that they make, and the first principle here, is treat all students as learners. Very often we hear, ah, the student's English is not good enough. Ah, the students who don't come from this university do not have enough uh, statistics for this particular course. Ah, the students who do not come from this university do not have those theories where we, which we would always build on in our master courses. Uh, and our own students have that from their bachelor programs, but the other students do not. Well, those students who come here are usually, uh, I would say, the very resourceful students. The students who are mobile, let's remind ourselves, have uprooted themselves, moved into a foreign culture, foreign context, uh, foreign food, foreign ways of doing things. So they have a lot of, of courage when they actually embark on that. They're strong, they're resourceful students, the, the vast majority of them anyway. And they bring a lot into the classroom. There might be some English or some statistics or some theory that they don't have. Okay, so they are learners, but then maybe the local students are learners for something else, which the 
uh, mobile students bring into the classroom. So the important thing is not to talk about the deficits of any group of students, but to talk about all the students as learners, but they have different strengths and different areas that they need to develop further. But they are all learners, and we should see them as learners. That's our number one um, uh, task as university teachers. Then, and these, uh, I have to say, these principles overlap each other. The second principle is to respect the diversity and adjust for it. And it's very much combined with, with, the, with the first principle that we think about the diversity as, as something that brings resources into the classroom, respect those uh, differences among the students, and adjust, adjust the way we teach in order to accommodate all students in the classroom. Then, something very important again is to provide specific and explicit information that fits the context. Again, if you're used to the local academic culture, you, there are a lot of things you take for granted. All students know when to sign up for the exams, or anything from practicalities like that to what do we mean when we say a project report. But if students come from a different academic background, a different local context and so on, they might have an other concept of what a project report looks like. They might not know that you need to sign up for exams, if you do need to do that if you signed up for the course. Um, so you will have to be very specific about what you expect from the students and how they are going to do things, how they're going to solve the tasks that you give them. It's always good to be explicit. Uh, in the context to all students, but it becomes even more important when you have students with different cultural backgrounds. And then the point that I have touched on several times, foster engagement and intercultural dialogue. The teachers from Copenhagen talk about how the students can learn from each other. I talked about how to get the students to work in multicultural groups, uh, in the classroom or between classes, on projects, whatever it is. It's the only way we can prepare students from actually uh, uh, being global citizens and working in a globalized society after they graduate. Um, and sometimes um, it needs a little bit of, 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 of introduction before you do it. And that comes back to the, to the previous point. Always be specific about why do you do what you do. So not only what do we expect, but also I want you to work in multicultural groups because, and the because can be because it prepares you for working in multicultural groups when you graduate. When they get into the labor market, they would never uh, get into a group where people have exactly the same background and the same disciplines as they do themselves. Project managers in, in, in uh, businesses and organizations would always have people with different backgrounds because they can contribute something different. And that's what the students also can take advantage of learning in the multicultural classroom. And then there are Two more points, which are more for the, for the teacher, uh, to reflect on what you do as a teacher and then evaluate and, and use the results to make adjustments. Oh, okay, this didn't go particularly well this time, so maybe I can adjust that, change that slightly, do it slightly differently next time round. I mean, nobody is perfect, but we have to try it out, see what works for us in our particular context, reflect on it, and then adjust it as, as uh, the need arises. And the bottom line, again, is to prepare students for life in a globalizing, diverse, and interconnected world. Whether we like it or not, this is what's out there. This is what we prepare the students for. And I think that the multicultural classroom and the internationalization of our higher education is the one way where we can prepare students for this situation uh, when they graduate.
Um, in, a, in a project uh, that I coordinated, the Interluni project, we had this, uh, this table here where we talked about the principles of the multicultural, multilingual classroom. And the bottom line here is, I don't want you to read all of it because time is running, but we have the teacher here in between the university and the students. And the important thing here is, you can't do everything alone. There's a lot that you can do in your own classroom just with your students, but a lot of the initiatives that need to be taken need also the support of the university and collaboration with the students. You can interact with the students in your classroom, but you need the framework of the university. It seems to me that Stockholm University really has set the priority for developing the multicultural classroom and the globalized uh, university um, as, as we speak. So, finally, the multicultural classroom is multifaceted. It has languages, cultures and didactics. The three overlap and are certainly also interconnected, as I've said. The way you meet the challenges must be fit for purpose in your specific context. The good practice principles that I just briefly introduced may guide you when you reflect on your own practice or it provides a common language for you to talk about uh, this with your students and with your colleagues. And finally, as I said, you can't go it all alone, but we can all do something and together we can do quite a lot. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, there is room for one or two questions before we go and have coffee. There's one way up there at the back. Can I see? Uh, is there anyone? Yes. Yeah. While Clara is running, the, um, the slides which will be made available to you has all the references on the next slides, so so you will be able to check uh, the uh, the references if if, Hi. if you want to. Yeah, I have a question about um, the emphasis you put on on the importance of where people come from, and because I, I am a bit confused about this. I mean, you're claiming that uh, things like, for example, here in Scandinavia, students ask questions. We believe that we're in Scandinavia is belief that it's important to ask questions as if this was not something that it would be important and that in other cultures they don't believe that. I think that there is, I can't, I can't quote from the top of my mind right now, but I'm sure there is quite a lot of scientific evidence that establishes that an inquisitive mind correlates with career success and life satisfaction. So to, to somehow leave this statement, like, you know, ask questions or not, as if it were a matter of opinion. Or to somehow um, give an importance to where you come from as a student. To me, it's a bit of a, either, either somehow we allow them to question something that should not be a matter of opinion, or we are taking a rather xenophobic perspective where we put a label on people and we claim that where they come from, it actually matters. That was my question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I really don't care where the students come from. I look at the students as a diverse group of individuals who, among other things, have the background of where they come from, what their ethnic culture is, what their experience is, what, where have they been until I meet them as bachelor students, master students, PhD students. And they have 
they have, some of them have long travels behind them, and some of them are, grew up in the local community, and some of them um, just came from somewhere else and moved directly to where, where I am. I don't care where they come from, and I certainly don't say, um, so, okay, so I have a group of students from Dada country, and therefore I need to do this or that. But I need to be aware of the fact that because of the diversity of the students in the classroom, I have to be aware of the fact that there might be students who will not be inquisitive, who will not ask questions of me, who will not challenge me unless I help them with the way I approach my teaching so that I make that space for them to force them, if you will, sometimes to also challenge or ask questions. Very brief anecdote, I had uh, a group of bachelor students who were writing their final project and they, they were offered some workshops together, I had 15, 20 of them, but they also offered one-on-one -on -one supervision with me on their own individual projects. There were two students from another culture in Europe uh, and I didn't know what that culture was until afterwards, but they didn't come to see me and I tried to get them to come to see me uh, for that one-on-one -on -one supervision, and they didn't. And they were the two students who got the lowest marks uh, when they finally defended their, their uh, project at an oral exam. And I uh, afterwards talked to them, and both of them said, um, individually, they were not together when I talked to them, Oh, but I come from a culture where if I ask a question uh, of the teacher, he might think I'm, he or she might think I'm stupid. And uh, since I haven't figured this out yet, so it already deducts from the grade that I will get at the end of the semester if I ask questions. But I said, no, you know, you can ask all the questions you want in the process. It's only what you hand in and defend at the end that's graded, for better and for worse. So we have to learn from this. I also had a student from another culture, and every time I asked her, do you understand? Is this okay? Uh, she would nod and say yes. Uh, and I realized afterwards she hadn't understood it, so I learned that I had to talk to her and then ask her to repeat in her own words what she got out of it before she left my office. So it's, it's learning to take that diversity into consideration in the way you teach your students, you organize their learning, you supervise their work, so that they actually don't lose out because they have a different culture from the one that, that is the local academic culture. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Come to my workshop, we can talk more. <laughs> this is a different classroom. It's always the students on the first three row that ask the questions. Now it's the one at the back. Yes? Yes, thank you. Um, it strikes me that as a teacher, it would be very effective for me if I could have some kind of summary. Okay, these students tend to nod when you, ask, when you ask them questions. These students are good at rote learning. These students tend not to ask questions, etc. cetera. Um, rather than having to discover all that for myself, whereas at the same time I realize I'm getting to in, into an area of profiling cultures. Um, is there any effective way for us to share an understanding of what's best to do with different cultures? Well, as, as you indicate yourself, uh, you can very easily fall into the trap of stereotyping uh, specific cultures. Um, and I think that in, in, in our context, in, in, in this part of the world, we, we would not want to do that. And I also have to say, you can't take it for granted that just because a student comes from a particular country, uh, they would have uh, particular approaches, because it all depends on their individual histories. Um, 
Um, years back, 10, 15 years back, there was a lot of discussion and a lot of literature in the UK and in Australia, for obvious reasons, uh, was focused on what do we do about the Asian students? And how do, we, how do we compare our westernized approaches to teaching and learning to sort of a Confucian tradition uh, coming out of China? Um, and first of all, it's stereotyping, uh, which I would hate to, to, to propagate. But the other thing is that um, Asian students are also diverse. Um, I was actually talking about some Eastern European students uh, in, in my example just a minute ago. Um, but we can't, we can't say, well, they come like this. What we have to take for granted is that we have a very diverse group of students. We might also have some very shy and introvert Swedish or Danish students, local students, that need to be treated differently from those who are very outgoing and always are sure to ask questions right at the beginning. So. I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid there isn't a quick fix for you. I, can, I understand why you ask the question, but, but you can't do it like that. You, you will have to, to just take for granted that there's a huge amount of diversity on, along a lot of parameters in your classroom. Sorry about that. Like so many other things, there are no quick fixes. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you all for listening. We want to thank you from CULM from Stockholm University. Thank you very much. Thank you.